So I was studying all those companies. I was studying Mongo, I was studying Rev Hat, trying to understand what good looks like and how these guys managed to, to create a public company on top of open source technology. Hey everybody, welcome to 100% Builders with Jam. Today we have Nikita Shambhunov on the podcast. Nikita is the founder and CEO of Neon that's powering the next generation of AI applications using a fully managed serverless Postgres. Nikita is an engineer, a founder, and an investor who has been building cutting edge database solutions over the past decade. Prior to founding Neon, he founded Single Store, formerly known as MemSQL, a next generation distributed transactional database, and was even at Meta on the infrastructure team in the early days. We can't wait to dive into his builder journey. Nikita, thank you so much for being here. Very excited to be here. You are one of those people who started as an engineer and became, you started your own company, became a founder, CTO, then eventually became the CEO, and then you started another company. Um, so you have a very interesting perspective about how you went through that journey. I would love to know how you started the company and adapted to learn new things on how to run a company. Like, would love to know more about that journey. Um, yeah, um, I, I think um, the important mindset for this is kind of the nerd mindset. And um, when you want to do something new, one of the best ways to figure that out is to, to see what good looks like. So there is a ton of information out there uh, about how to do whatever you want well. You know, you can, you, you know, make latte art well, and you can go to YouTube and learn how to do that. Or you can go on YouTube and learn how to run companies well. Uh, and so earlier in our kind of a, a brief chat before we started the podcast, we were discussing, you know, how to operate. And you can go on YouTube. And I was telling how I was, I was just rewatching Peter Boy, uh, uh, lecture 14 in the Stanford series of, of how to operate. So there's a lot of information out there. You know, the thing is when you're a founder and when you need to do something and you put yourself into the position where you have to figure that out. Not only you have, um, um, you know, the intellectual curiosity, the, the situation forces you to go and figure that out. And you are uh, faced with choices. You know, you can do A versus B versus Z uh, and, and you, you need to make those choices um, and, and you need to act on them. And uh, when you build a company, there isn't that much time. So you have to, so you learn uh, both by um, living through this and by the pressure of acting fast and making the decisions fast. Um, and if you, if you tend to do things quickly, uh, your, your, your speed of learning improves as well. So the faster you spin the, the gears and the faster your feedback loop, um, then uh, the faster you learn yourself. It's kind of interesting that when you build software, your feedback loop is very, very fast. Um, you know, you, you run, write a program and you write some tests and whatever, and like it either works or it doesn't. And so you're, you're in control in a way of your own productivity. And then, then the computer system kind of gives you that feedback in, in the real world. That's not always the case. And, um, when you do something against the real world, um, the world does give you feedback and sometimes this feedback is in action. Um, you know, sometimes that means it didn't work, uh, or sometimes that means, um, it did work. I don't know. Like, uh, so you have to be constantly interpreting the feedback that, that the world gives you to your action, um, and, uh, and, and adjusting those actions. Um, and your tools, there are technology, your tools, there are, are communication and presence. Uh, and that was one of the things I have to really learn, um, as I took over as CEO. Um, and, uh, the, your, your tools are your team, which is probably the, the most important thing for, for, for driving impact, uh, in this world. So, um, yeah, I guess the short answer is like the nerd mentality for doing whatever is the right mentality in my opinion. Um, and when you learn how to be CEO, um, it is about, uh, um, about your North star, about your team. And it's actually about, um, funding. Cause like it is on the CEO's agenda to not run out of money. 
you know, I love this idea of having the nerd mentality and you said something super interesting. Like as a former engineer, I, I like get that point where you have this like quick iteration, quick feedback loop when you're doing something, seeing if it's working and you want to apply the same mentality when you're learning a new skill. Um, but navigating that, the, the, the feedback loop in the real world is very different and like very uh, difficult in a way where it's not clear all the time. So as someone who was transitioning for our audience, it was transitioning from like a technical role to being a CEO or a founder, what advice do you have for people making that transition and that learning with quick uh, feedback loops? Uh, well, the first one I think is, is, is great to have mentors. Um, and there are mentors that will mentor you because they like you. Um, and generally it's a surprising because it's flattering to mentor someone actually. So there is actually a lot of people who are willing to mentor you and, and in a way you kind of want to choose, um, and hopefully you will, will, you will, you will find, uh, amazing mentors and they will likely do it for free. They, sometimes they might be advisors to your company, but you know, if somebody reaches out to me and says, you, you get a, I want you to be my mentor. I actually not going to ask for equity in return. Um, and the reason to that is I think, you know, paying for it is a good thing generally. And then, um, uh, the moments you put, uh, compensation on this thing, it becomes a job. Um, and it takes out the important, um, uh, the, the, the most important bit out, you take the most important bit out, which is what is this whole thing about? Uh, it, it's about basically maximizing the potential of, 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 of this specific individual. And so having mentors is important. Um, in addition to mentors, it's actually good to have a coach that you pay for. Uh, and, and the reason to have a coach is, well, there are certain things you, you cannot talk to your board about because for that, for the board, you want to work through problems and project confidence. And sometimes you're just not sure. And, um, or sometimes you, you, you floundering, like whatever, like so there's not everything you can discuss with the board. In a way, co-founders are also, um, you know, um, you, you measured anyway. It's like, you want to discuss a relationship with your co-founder. Um, well, you don't want to do it every day, at least like, you know, you can have a, a, a conversation about it. It's not something you want to talk about every day about. Um, and that's what a coach is good for. It's just like help you navigate through the, uh, this information and, you know, give you the, the opportunity to say something completely dumb and call you on that and this kind of stuff. Um, now that's a, that is, that is a support system. Um, uh, the other advice is, um, is. Um, well, there's a lot, uh, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, as CEO, um, you want to, you, 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 you're driving the company somewhere, uh, right. You have a vision and, and, um, you're setting that direction, you are allocating funding to the company where, you know, well, well, this team is doing this versus this team is doing that. Um, you inspiring people. Um, so there's all those things that are doing that's new that you might not have been doing as an engineer. Um, um, as CEO, and I think it's, get, get, uh, it, it's easier with founders than hired CEOs. Um, it, you have a, a model of your company and you feel it. Um, and when you feel the company and people just often have like similar feelings towards the company they have their own kids. Uh, it's like another kid or something like this. They feel physical pain if the company is not doing well and stuff like that. Um, so that allows you to, to refine, uh, what is the one, two most important thing you can do for the company and as CEO, ideally you want to focus on those things and get those things done and then build a team around you that will pick up the rest, uh, which is like in the company, usually the way to run it is everything is important. That's like a, a classic startup mantra. You know, you'd rather not do, do something at all rather than doing it poorly, because if you do it poorly, it sets a poor standard for the company and, uh, it, you know, and like people get sloppy because like, well, they get an excuse because that thing in the corner is not, is not up to the standard. So you'd rather do less, but whatever you do, you, 
you know, everything is important. Um, and so, um, as you're building your team, uh, as CEO, and that's you, what you want to spend a good amount of time on, um, you can focus on one, two, high order bits, you know, key partnership, um, you know, key investment, uh, key customer, uh, key hard technological problem where you dive deep and then, and understand, you know, a paradigm shift can show up, which it just did right with AI generative AI and like, what does it mean? What does it mean for my company? Um, and, um, and you figure that out, but as you do that, you need to make sure that the wheels don't come off and that's the strength of your team. That's super helpful. And, you know, you just mentioned AI, maybe it's, it's a good time to talk about Neon. Can you tell us a bit more about what Neon does and why did you start the company? So I had this idea for about seven years now, and uh, I first had it when I was at Single Store. And Single Store is a distributed transactional database with a very strong analytical capabilities, now positions itself. It's like one-stop shop for everything data. Um, um, and one of the problems there, I wanted to solve for us to become the default database for a very broad use case. So, you, you know, when, when you, you know, build single store, like it's cool because you support very, very large high-end workloads. So I think our largest customer is like a $37 million deal for single store over many years. And, uh, we solved a very important problem for this large financial institution. Um, and there is a certain amount of pride there. Um, but there's not that many workloads of that complexity out there. And there are uh, a ton more kind of mundane workloads, which you see a lot, right? You know, bread and butter database workloads. Um, well, and as you go to enterprises, you see uh, people using, you know, something like single store, or that could be like large scale solution, like Snowflake, Databricks, uh, that kind of stuff, Hadoop or whatever. Um, you know, these big data, large scale workloads competing on, on like different capabilities and single store happens to be faster in real time and this kind of stuff. Um, and then you see like a ton of bread and butter workloads and people are using like Postgres, MySQL, Mongo, and you like Mongo, we see Mongo everywhere. And, and then you see Mongo is a public company and doesn't do anything like crazy hard, but like there's a lot of it out there and they're kind of the default for a document store. So, so the question of being the default for something that's really general purpose was an interesting one. And I was trying to figure that out for single store first. And then I came up with this idea, um, that instead of surfacing very high end workloads, can you drop the barrier to entry for the most basic bread and butter workloads? So come to the market from a completely different end. So it's a different side, side of this gigantic market. And then, you know, you see manga everywhere by, by being in the market and selling single store. And you see Postgres everywhere and Postgres doesn't have a vendor. And I was like, Ooh, that's interesting. Um, and so, but they, but that doesn't mean that you can be that vendor, right? Like Linux doesn't have a vendor. Maybe, well, Red Hat could be one, but you know, like, you know, how many, how many Linux vendors are, are, are there? So you gotta have something unique that is, um, also defensible, uh, from the technology standpoint. And so. So I was studying all those companies. I was studying Mongo, I was studying uh, uh, Rev Hat, uh, trying to understand what good looks like and how these guys managed to, to create a public company on top of uh, open source technology. Um, and then the, the uh, light bulb went up when I was studying AWS Aurora, uh, which is a big, um, now multi-billion dollar service for, for, for Amazon and being a database professional, I see the architecture of separating storage and compute. And that's where it's like, well, what if like, well, they have this proprietary storage that they built, but what if we had an, an open source storage like this? Uh, uh, because it is generally useful in the cloud. Uh, and if it is open source and you can counter position yourself with something that's very large. Uh, so that was like the, the origination of the idea and well, can we build that storage Well, you know, we built whole database just now, including storage. So like, I mean, hell yeah, we can build that storage. Um, and, I, and so, but then I was trying to actually fund this idea instead of building it because running a single store. 
I was calling my friends working at Aurora and saying like, Hey, you know, maybe we can incubate it together or something. And like, we're no takers. Um, so eventually when I transitioned from single store, uh, to, uh, Kosla, I decided to incubate this company and then it took off. Like company is only two uh, years old and change. Um, uh, and we already, uh, you know, um, value the 380 million and have 150,000 databases on the platform. So it's a, um, that, that low end hypothesis, um, is, is starting to, to work and play out. So that was the, the origination of, of Neo. I want to go back to something you said before you started your company, you studied the competitors. What does study mean? And for anyone listening who's about to start a company, what are the two things they should do to de-risk it based on what you learned in that process? So I think there is this thing, and I, and I think um, uh, Andreessen actually talks about is an idea maze. Uh, and if you listen to his podcast, I think that was the most recent one with Lex Friedman. Um, well, he talks about the idea maze. And um, it's basically a... Um, a path that you plot in your head first, you can write it down. Uh, how are you going to build this company? Like in layman terms, can you just explain what are you going to do first? What are you going to build first? How are you going to get the first users? Why are they going to show up? What are you going to do exactly? Are you going to be flying around the country? Are you going to call your friend? Like what, what are you going to do? Um, and um, why do you think it's going to work? Uh, and what are the risks? Um, and so which ones are you going to de-risk uh, sooner rather than later? And, and studying, I think studying the companies, um, um, I think it's just useful uh, and humbling uh, because until, so, and, and, and I have a lot of scars building single store uh, where I think we made a, did a lot of things right and we made a lot of mistakes too. Uh, and that all generates scar tissue. Um, uh, but it doesn't stop you from trying to do more of that or again, or different company, um, because, you know, we'll build in is accelerating. Um, I think studying is useful in condensing the results of your study in something that look like the idea maze that they went through and it trying to explain it to your friends. It's like, look, you know, this is what I'm observing. Like these guys, they're right. Do you agree? And they're like, well, yeah, I agree. And that's what it's looking from the outside in. Um, the benefit of living in the Silicon Valley is also you can like call up some people who were part of their journey and like compare, compare notes. Um, and they will confirm or are not that. And that will make you um, better in understanding the world, um, which I, you know, Am I good at it? Well, I keep learning and I'm trying to become better and better at it. And this is an interesting exercise that will train that muscle of, of understanding the world. Um, and if you understand the world well and you find little holes uh, uh, that the world's missing, so you can fill out those holes and that's your company, right? And so now you move the world in a, in a, in a, in a wider way. As you were doing this process, how were you collecting insights and what did your notes look like at the time? Like, how were you organizing all this? I don't have a system. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, I have no book. Um, and, um, uh, and have a pen, uh, uh, I mostly write, I don't read. Good <laughs> settle. Uh, so when I write, I really, so I think it's more a tactile feeling of putting stuff on paper, but I think the higher abyss you just remember, um, they're on the hard. If you're, if you're obsessive about something, um, then, uh, your brain filters the information that is not useful and whatever the useful stuff you remember, like the, you know, that like the rat hat thing is trying to understand how, how those came about and, and, and why it worked and like, where are they now? Uh, when they went into the multi-product journey and how they responded to the commoditization of their core business and the cloud, right? Um, which was the acquisition of um, whatever their Kubernetes thing. And eventually that didn't work. So it worked only up to a point and then they, they, they sold off to IBM. 
it's a large non-growing business. Um, so, um, and then why Mongo worked and Mongo is like the, well, the database technology is so near and dear to my heart. And I spent so much time in the industry that it's among us fascinating because they didn't have good technology for a long time. Um, and, but they did have the developer front door and eventually they built out the technology and now it's very solid. It took a long time. Um, but you, they managed to balance the the adoption of the of the users and some of them would have bad experience um but that created feedback and they were responding to the feedback loop and use open source to be able to to put that flow to not die down and stay on the learning curve and iterate and eventually the product matured um uh, and then i started obsessively their go to market and i understood what it doesn't work and i spoke to their heads of sales and um, and, uh, uh, their transitions and, you know, F1, F2, F3, I know their current CEO, previous CEO. Um, so, um, um, and everything just points into one thing that the, the developer love translates to eventual value. Wow. You know, Nikita, you were clearly someone who is, who takes a very deliberate approach like when like solving specific problems, like very thoughtful about it. And something that you were saying earlier really caught my attention. Like Neon's valuation is almost half a billion. Right now you started two years ago, over a hundred thousand databases. What are things that you, what are the things you did to get your first customers? Yeah, so, um, and I'll tell you the single first story as well. Um, we got our first customer by knocking the, well, we published something. Um, you know, Eric and I wrote a blog post about how to run something at scale or how to build a distributed system. And somebody reached out that was Zynga. And that was our first customer, um, first material, uh, actually first customer we got through Gary Tan and introduction for Y Combinator and, and a startup is called Backplane, uh, which is no more. And then Zynga reached out after I was publishing the architecture of a distributed system. Then we hired a VP of sales and went straight to our enterprise and the rest is history. And that's kind of set the company on that enterprise high-end sale. Um, uh, and um, with Nia, it was different. So um, we never hunted for customers. We, we basically, first we, we put out our code on GitHub uh, and then certain people would reach out. And then those we asked if they want to be our early customers and some said yes. Um, from there, uh, we saw the GitHub star growth on, on GitHub. So now we're like, I don't know, 10, not 10,000, 9,000 stars, something like this. Uh, well, the storage product. Um, and then, uh, um, or just like, you know, the, the kernel of Nian, but Nian is a managed service. Uh, so it's a, it's a piece. Um, and then, uh, um, and then we put together a wait list and then we launched and our website leaked in Hacker News and people started to sign up on the wait list. Uh, and that started to generate traffic. And so it's not like there's like five early customers that you know by name. It's more of you have a daily traffic on your website with people signing up on, on the wait list, which we redirect to a survey. Um, and they fill in up that survey and then that informs us of what they care about and what they're currently on and why they care about what we're offering. Um, and then we launched it publicly. Oh, uh, we started on board those users and make sure they are successful batch by batch. And then we started to see more and more of them successful. We started to increase the, the number of those batches. And eventually we dropped the wait list December 6th last year. And since December 6th, we, we, we now at 150,000 uh, databases. Um, so that's it's a different way of generating customers, uh, and users. I think a better way to say is users because in a way they're a little anonymous to us. I mean, sure. They sign up with their emails and stuff. But it's not like this five big companies that, you know, you, you know, the, the engineering teams of and by name and all of that. It's more of a, it's a completely self-serve product, a bunch of nerds twisting knobs on the back end, 
and, uh, uh, you know, staring at retention cohorts, look, you know, measuring product analytics, trying to make sure it's incredibly easy to consume. And that's the act one of the company. And we're still not out of the act one. And then the act two will be going into more of a mid market and eventually enterprise and the enterprise world. We will be knowing our customers by name and talking to the CIOs and stuff like that, but that hasn't arrived yet. Traditional Silicon Valley lore is ship fast, ship messy, test live. But the thing with the database is if it's low quality, you lose trust in the company forever. Or like, it's, like you can't use a database that doesn't have a hundred percent uptime performance. Um, clearly you're someone who moves fast. How, how did you think about the MVP speed versus quality? And how does your team continue to deliver quality today while moving fast? So, you know, back to my SQL server days, uh, and that was told to me by, by one of our board members used to be my boss, Quentin Clark, which was told to him by his boss, whose name is Ted Coomer, who's in the, the, the single store board. And there are like two date sins in the, in the world of databases and everything else will be forgot, uh, you know, forgiven, but not those two, which is corrupted data and wrong results. So don't corrupt people's data which is lose people's data and don't give them wrong results. Um, uh, we haven't done that at Neon. Uh, we haven't, uh, lost people's data, uh, and we haven't corrupted results. Um, we have, however, had downtime and the counter to that is being free and having a free tier and, uh, being in the technical preview longer that you think you should be, um, and be upfront about your uptime. So there's neonstatus.com and you can see all the outages. Um, and, uh, when somebody runs into an issue, our observability system flags it and we reach out to them and let them know. I think that level of transparency is probably what, um, and then being free for a period of time, um, uh, is, is some of that defensibility. Being free is, and having a free tier is an incredible way just to test the limits of your system and have as few surprises as possible as people, um, you know, roll up to the serious workloads and it costs you something, right? But, um, despite the fact that there are single percentage point conversion from free to pay last month, we, our consumption on paid exceeded our consumption on free. So like paid users, they, cons they, they just consume a lot more than, than the free users. Uh, but the fact that we are having incredibly efficient, cost efficient free tier, um, lets us practice running a large fleet. So, um, and that's why starting from free to small and medium business to mid market to enterprise allows you to learn as you build, uh, because obviously in the beginning there will be bugs. I, I mean, uh, and everybody who is trying to build a you know, uh, a storage system or any systems project and say that we're not going to have outages like page line because, uh, um, you know, you can't do it absolutely perfectly. Um, I love it. Nikita, you know, a lot of your users and customers are building AI applications. Uh, how are they leveraging Neon? So, um, so AI is one of those things that you cannot be ignoring today. Uh, and the, the first question we asked is, what does that mean for us? Uh, and what does it mean for our users? And, um, we arrived into, uh, two distinct, um, answers for now. And we funded both. The first one is that as people build AI applications, uh, they need memory, they need vector stores. Um, and just so happened, uh, Postbus is a platform. There's already a vector store called PG vector which we support. And so by that nature, we kind of already have it. Um, so, but having this and having expertise in it is that two different things. And so we decided to get better at vector stores and we funded our own effort and we built our own vector index, uh, which called PG embedding. Um, and we position it not as a competitor to PG vector because we support both. We position it as a competitor to commercial vector databases, such as Pinecone and, uh, you know, open source, but still separate We V8 and yada, yada, yada. There's a million of them now. Um, the reason we're doing that is, um, one of the biggest sins, um, 
uh, uh, are ignoring paradigm shifts. And so it doesn't really matter where you start. And, you know, vector stores is just like something that people want in the, in this new world. And they might not want that tomorrow, by the way, because like, who knows, maybe open AI will pull in that functionality into chat GPT. And we would just won't need to, to have those vector stores anymore. But what that allows us to be is it allows us to be in the learning curve. Um, and you want to be on the learning curve, providing functionality, uh, that, that people want today. And then being in conversation with people who are building those AI apps and what they want in the future. And so from there, we kind of observed that, okay, well, vector store is a piece of infrastructure, but what are they, what are the means to an end? It means to an end, but what is they're actually building in this AI apps? And I think that splits into a couple, couple categories. One is what is called RAGS, uh, retrieval augmented generation, which is basically like a next generation search system or a, a recommendation system. People build search systems, recommendation systems, and people build uh, Im image search. And then people build um, just kind of like all of that together, call it multi-model. So, okay, well, you know, what are the all the data pieces that you need in order to, to build a full app? And of course you have a database, you have a vector store, you have open AI or any other large language model. And, but then there's like all this other things around. So that creates an ecosystem and an app stack. And, and you try to see what is your place there and how much of that functionality you pull in at your platform and how much you integrate with partners. Um, and so as you go in through that exercise, it's important to ship. So we ship PG embedding and we're going to build more of that functionality there. Um, and, and that's still kind of part of the vector store. We actively exploring rags and, um, and rags have, um, a vector store piece, which is like step three or something like this, then it's a multi-stage ranking, uh, this like all of all, everything around rags and we we're still don't know what we're going to do. Are we going to have an integrated rag experience that you can build around Postgres? Or we find partners for each piece of it and then take, you know, maybe just the vector piece um, and, and do that very well and integrate with everybody else. We're exploring that. No, no, no decision yet. The other thing that we're observing is like, hey, um, um, and there's one crazy one too. Um, the crazy one is like, do we need to host Llama or do we not need to host Llama? And I don't have an answer to that question. So like, at least we're, we're debating that internally. Um, but the other thing that, that is that, that there are the completely different ways to look in at the problem is, okay, so if, when I manage a database, uh, when I run a database as a developer, I can run it with consumer of a database, you know, I'm building an app and I'm running an app. And then there's all the things that you need to worry about, um, to, to manage and tune the database. And there's even a, a a title for those people, uh, which is a DBA, right? Database administrator. Well, can you have a DBA.ai? Uh, can you have an AI DBA? Because if you do, then you save people from not have, for a lot of people can just not have it at all. Um, and, um, a lot of larger organizations that have large groups of DBAs, they can have very leveraged DBAs, so they can have much fewer of the DBAs that manage much larger fleets of the database. And what is managing at the end of the day? Well, managing is not just provisioning and running and upgrading. Managing is also making sure the apps run smoothly. And that means creating indexes and set, changing settings, uh, inside database and, and, um, you know, that's like a bunch of stuff and supporting the developer workflow as you're doing it. Um, cause with, when people build apps, they, as they build apps, they also need functionality there. So a lot of that stuff could be automated. Um, and now you're not making something like 20% more efficient than a similar product from Amazon. You making it, you know, maybe even the same efficiency, but Hey, you know, there's a whole bunch of people uh, around that system that you don't need at all. Um, and so that create makes the product a lot more valuable and, and, and a lot more usable. So it's another way of, of looking at the and the AI value that you can bring with your products. The thing that gets me really excited about when I hear this, uh, Dikita, is 
And for our audience out there, if you're building anything or if you're building something in AI, Yon is like the one-stop shop and you can build the things that you normally build with, with fewer people. And that's really exciting. And, and, and that's the new trend, right? So that's why people are saying, you know, every paradigm shift usually, usually creates jobs and people are like, but this one, we don't know. Like, she's like, we'll see, we'll see about this one. One, one thing that really sticks out is, um, clearly you're, you're very thoughtful, you have frameworks for thinking both in how you plan what to work on next, as you're planning how to, how to leverage each paradigm shift. How do you structure your day, your week as a CEO to give you that space and time to think, to give you space and time to learn? What do you delegate? What do you not? How do you set yourself up, continue to do that for the company? Well, the first thing is this, uh, it changes. It changes as, as the company grows um, and it changes with the set of priorities uh, that you have. Um, a lot of this is hiring. Uh, a lot of this is hiring uh, and then uh, creating enough activity to understand, um, uh, we either know what you want to do next and then you have one or two priorities and then blinders on, get that done. And that could be signing up a partner, a particular partner, uh, or, um, you know, getting that AI thing through. And then you look at your audit, your calendar and your calendar better reflect your priorities. And if it doesn't, you're doing something wrong. Um, the other one is hiring. And then usually in hiring, if you have one or two hires that you, that you, you want to make for your company right now, we're looking for head of AI, for example, and we, we might know who that is, you know, if we sign them, then that is great. If not, you know, keep searching. Um, then again, like your calendar should reflect the fact that you're, you're going after, um, uh, hiring those people. Um, so I, I, I'm a huge fan of having, even for yourself. Um, ideally one, but like worst case two priorities, uh, of course, and that's what Keith says in his, uh, lectures as well. If you have many priorities, you tend to procrastinate more and you tend to focus on the ones that you know how to solve, but not the ones that are the highest needle mover for the business. And so that where you need to be extremely honest with yourself, um, and, and, um, and also raise the white flag if you, if you're failing and, and like get some help from your team or externally. Um, and if you have one problem, that's the one that are you obsessing about? And that's the one you're talking to everybody about how to solve and, and that what helps you eventually solve, solve that. So that's one. The, the, the other bit that you cannot stop doing is investing your team and, and making sure your team grows. Um, and, um, as, as you work with your people, with you, as you mentor your people. Um, you can either grow people, you can buy expertise, right? And sometimes people say companies grow faster than, than people. Um, it, that is the case sometimes, right? But it's obviously a function of how fast the company is growing and how fast an individual is growing. So in a way, if an individual is growing, the company grows slowly and an individual is growing faster, you can keep giving more and more responsibilities to that individual. The company is hockey sticking. Well, sometimes you need to go and, 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 and get that expertise externally. Um, it's interesting that at Nian, um, a, a lot of the people are homegrown, um, and, uh, head of engineering, head of products, head of DevRel is external ex Mongo, um, and, uh, uh, head of PLG, uh, motion and head of partners is someone I, I worked with before. But also in a way homegrown because she's it's like the first time she's doing um uh the the kind of like the, the the top role. Um I'm a big believer in that. Um uh and that's where you know you invest in your team and the reward is that the team performs very, very well. Um and and there is um uh there is that appreciation of people's capabilities that come in, um, and the ability of people to step up to, to those challenges. So to me, that's like really important. Uh, and that's where, where, what drives the enjoyment of, of work to is to, to see how, how capable people either already are becoming and, 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 and like graduate, graduate into the next level of excellence. You know, it sounds like, um, 
it's one of those things that you said earlier, like when you are helping these people grow and when you are helping yourself grow, like finding a mentor in that journey is super important. What are some steps people can take to find a great mentor? I think we, well, people should try, right? Um, so when you build a company, naturally you meet a lot of people and you start with investors, right? And, um, uh, your company either already works without any external investments or you raise around the funding. Well, you already have people who are very interested in your success who are your investors. And maybe you can sign up some angels, um, that also, you know, write smaller checks into your company. Um, and that's your initial network, right? Um, investors in the Silicon Valley are naturally very connected, so they can always introduce you to, uh, to other, uh, CEOs. Um, and they'd like to do that. That's uh, part of their job. Um, and ideally they, they can introduce you to executives. They can introduce you to scale CEOs. They can introduce you to retired CEOs who have more time in their hands and, and can help you out. So, um, that's one conduit to, to building that network. Um, another one is, well, if you, if there is a particular person you, you admire, um, and it's not like Zachary or Musk, like, you know, maybe, like, you know, uh, not, not as big because these people are, you know, extremely busy. Um, I guarantee you will have a response if you just email this person out of the blue. Uh, it's like, I'm, I'm a CEO of this little company, XYZ, that is aspiring to become this big company. Um, and I'm modeling a lot of that stuff from your experiences. We can I buy you coffee? Just like write right this email, this short, um, and like 70, 80%, you will get a response and you will get your coffee. And if it clicks, you know, this, that person can become your mentor. The other place we, which in it generates interesting mentorship and just like networking opportunities is, uh, exec searches. So, uh, exec searches cost you, costs a lot of money. So each exec search is like hundred, hundred twenty thousand dollars. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's expensive. Uh, so, uh, and then you're hiring, you know, head of engineering, head of product, like whatever, VP level person. And through that, you just meet a lot of people. You meet a lot of people and, um, they're unlikely your mentors, uh, but they're useful, uh, um, uh, yeah, they're useful nose in the, in the Silicon Valley graph, uh, of, of capable individuals. And with some, you connect very well. And if you go and search for, um, you know, a COO or a board member, uh, or a CEO. And, you know, we, we did search for a CEO at, at single store at some point, uh, and eventually I took over, um, oh, well, you meet some serious people through that process. Uh, and some of them specifically like Suresh for Sudevan eventually became the board member of single store and, and have very good relationships since he didn't become single store CEO. Uh, but we connected super well and, you know, we, you know, we're friends. So that's, um, that's an example of what else generates networks, uh, in the Silicon Valley partnerships, CEO summits, um, you know, meetups with other founders, investors, super angels, a lot Gill, for example, or Nat Friedman are like this super conductive material that's connected to everything in the Silicon Valley. Um, um, and, and they're happy to help. That's their job to introduce you to, to, you know, person A, B, or C. There's so much we want to ask you, but we're out of time. Nikita, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people follow Neon, your work, your learnings, your journey? Follow me on Twitter. My handle is NikitaBase, uh, as in like once I decided that I'm going to be putting database for the, for the rest of my life, that's my, that's my handle. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the Neon handle on Twitter is Neon Database. Um, we couldn't get Neon, but Neon Database is, is close enough. Uh, so please follow, follow us on Twitter. Um, there's a lot of good stuff coming in. We, we're shipping continuously, uh, and sharing all the takes on the, on the, on the systems and data world. Nikita, thanks for coming. Love it. Thank you, Nikita. Thank you so much.